seems there's only one song that we could sing, and we're going to sing it, Victory in Jesus. <laughs> standing with your Bibles open to the Gospel of John chapter 11. This is a familiar story to those who are acquainted with the scripture and uh, the resurrection of Lazarus. And this morning we are just taking a part of that story, but it is an important part. And so from the Gospel of John chapter 11, beginning at verse 38. Jesus therefore again groaning in himself, coming to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus said unto her, Said not I unto thee that if thou wouldst believe, thou shouldst see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. 
and I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him and let him go. Thank you, our Father, for the precious living word of God that has been written for us today. But thank you for the precious living word of God that lives within us today and has come to abide with us here this morning, invite us here to celebrate the resurrection, the new life that we have through Jesus Christ our Lord, and knowing that one day we'll hear the call to come forth. But for now, we have much work to do. But more important for this moment, we have much worship to give. We unite our hearts, minds, souls, and spirit in praise and adoration to the Lord, thanking you that you've given us new life and knowing that you've left to each and every one of us the decision about what that quality of life is going to be. Thank you, Father, today for eternal life through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. And our prayer this morning is for anyone who's never trusted Christ as their Savior, that this will be the golden hour, this will be the precious moment, that the Lord awakens them to the realization people need the Lord. Thank you, Father, for all your blessings and for what we're going to hear, receive, and experience. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated, and our welcome to you this morning as we have come together somewhere during the week, and I guess I said something about this last Sunday. We just kind of set aside today as a family reunion revival and uh, just a moment when we could emphasize the family getting back together. And uh, we thank the Lord that he's opened the doors many ways uh, for us to come together and worship together this Sunday and every Sunday. And so we are celebrating here today and welcoming you as you come and just asking you to take the opportunity in the course of the day of the coming week to invite others, uh, let them know that it's okay, <laughs> it's safe for them to come, and uh, I've been here every Sunday, and I'm still standing, so uh, that uh, ought to tell everybody else something, and uh, I'm just thankful today that you have chosen to come and, and be with us, and we pray that in due time there are others that will enter into that comfort zone and just come and share together. I'm looking forward to the sermon this morning, uh, and I don't care if I am preaching it, I'm looking forward to this moment, and uh, I just pray that the Spirit of God would use every person and every part of this service to glorify His name today. As you saw just a moment ago, the girls are anxious to sing, and uh, I'm going to ask Sherry, if you would, to introduce this song and, uh, and come and share with us, introduce the girls, uh, and share with us this message that the Lord has prepared this morning for you. much for giving us the opportunity to share this message and song with you today. Um, we would like to introduce our granddaughters to you. Uh, Alexis is the one closest to me here, Regan, Braylon, and Keelan. And we have several other grandchildren as well that are not with us today, and we are certainly proud of each and every one of them. Um, wanted to just give you a little bit of background about this song. Susanna found the song and sent it to me in a link on Facebook. And I listened to it and I thought, oh, that song is beautiful. 
So Susanna taught it to the girls, and the girls taught it to me. So they, they actually taught Grandma something. <laughs> so it is a song that has such a powerful message to it, goodness of God. And the words to the chorus will be displayed on the overhead, and we would certainly welcome you to join us.
thank you, Sherry and the quartet. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll have to come up with an official name uh, for them. I have an official name for some people this morning. Hope you're not one of them. Tomb dwellers. There were two in the scripture that were most familiar. One of them more so than another. We'll get back to our friend Lazarus in just a bit, but he wasn't the only tomb dweller in the Bible. He may have been the most familiar, but in the fifth chapter of the Gospel of Mark, our Lord had just come across the Sea of Galilee through that nighttime horror of a storm. Remember that with his disciples. When they got to the other side, he encountered one man who wasn't, I guess by my definition, a maniac. He was a demoniac, a man whose life was totally consumed by demons. And make no mistake about it, this was not your average demon-possessed man either. The scripture says that they couldn't contain him, constrain him with shackles and chains. He would break them. As he roamed about, he was the terror of the town. No self-respecting parent would even consider letting their child go out in the community for fear of encountering this beast. And no self-respecting woman would ever leave her home, go anywhere by herself. And I doubt there were very few men who would go anywhere by themselves either, probably in quartets. For well, this man was possessed by demons, and no doubt about it, the scripture says he was a tomb dweller. When we talk about tombs, I want you to understand, we're not talking about gravestones like we have in the cemetery here. They were caves, whether natural or man-made, located in the side of hills, and they contained two compartments. One would be basically a chamber of death where the dead were buried. That would be the backside of the tomb. But on the front side, it was something like a vestibule. Many of them had stools for seating where people could just recline. And after about a year from the time a deceased had been placed in the tomb, they would enter that inner chamber, take the stones out, put them in a stone box, and then the space would be available for the next in the family who died. This man evidently found refuge in the front part of that tomb, and that was his dwelling place. But that was the least of his concern. The man was demon-possessed. And so the irony of it is Jesus left one side of the Sea of Galilee where the multitudes were after him for healing, deliverance, anything they needed and he could offer, and he could offer whatever they needed, went across the Sea of Galilee and encountered one man. But that's what our Lord does. He'll go wherever he needs to. He'll go out of his way to meet the needs of one demon-possessed person. And this man had more demons than you can count. He had more demons than he had bacteria. And so when he arrived, the demoniac fell on his face before the Lord and said, don't torture me. Let's explain something. It's interesting that the first thing we need is the last thing we want. And this man definitely needed deliverance for the Lord. But please understand something else. This man, and any time he spoke, for all intents and purposes, it was the demons who were speaking within him. And they recognized that doomsday is coming for them. And so they would ask the Lord, do not torture us. And so when the Lord asked this man, what is your name? The demons in him answered and said, Legion, for we are many. Which is simply another way of saying there's more of us than you can count. And not only that, there's more of us than there are of you too. That mattered not to the Lord because he had prevailing power 
over any and all demons. And so the Lord did what only the Lord could do. He brought the demons out of this man, but the demons recognizing what was awaiting them said, Lord, we don't want to be tortured. We don't want to be destroyed. And so they give a very interesting offer to the Lord. There's some pigs out here. Grant that we could go unto them. And I find that very unusual. I find that very interesting. It ought to be very humbling to any of us today, to anyone who has never trusted Christ as their Savior, to know that a pig is the devil's second choice. If he can't be in you, they want to be in a pig. And not only that, on that particular day, I find out something else too. A pig would rather die than be demon-possessed because the Scripture says there were about 2,000 of them. And when the demons entered into that, those swine, those 2,000 pigs, they ran violently down the hill and into the stream and drowned. Let me tell you, there's a whole lot of bacon that went down the creek that day. And there are a whole lot of people that lost a whole lot of money. They lost a whole lot of bacon too, in more ways than one. So let's be clear this morning. What happened? Back to the man who had never had for years upon years, a day of normal living in his life, all of a sudden, he's living a normal life. He's living a Christ-filled life. This man, the Scripture says, is the one who, when the people came out of the towns to find what he was, was looking at, what he was looking like, they found a man who was dressed sitting calmly before the Lord, and make no mistake about it, the Lord had given him a quality of life he had never known. Something about 20 years ago, I guess it was, the first man that I ever knew who had heart bypass surgery asked his physician, asked his surgeon, what is going to be my quality of life? And the Lord said, the physician said, I heal the body. The quality of life is up to you. And so this young man, free of demons for the first time in who knows how long, has gone out and his desire was to go with the Lord. Why would he not? Why would anybody who had been delivered from all of those demons who'd had such a change in life as this man had had, not want to follow the one who made that change. But the Lord denied his request. He said, That's, you've got a mission field. I'll tell you where it is. You go and share your story. You go and share the gospel with other people. And so it was one man who was a cave dweller. All of a sudden came out of his cave and he was right there. The scripture tells us, that on the outskirts of society. Now he is a member of society. He is a contributing member of society. He is a welcome member of society. But then, a bit later, Jesus visits another tomb. It's the tomb of Lazarus. You know the story. The Lord came to Mary and Martha, but as far as they were concerned, he came four days late. And they let him know about it. They told him two different women said on separate occasion the same thing. When two women say the same thing on different occasions, you know they've had their heads together. They've been talking this over. And they said to him, Lord, if you had been here, this would not have happened. This wouldn't have happened. And how often have we accused the Lord likewise? We have said to him concerning some dilemma in our life, Lord, if you had been here, this would not have happened. Then he said to Mary, Martha, did I not tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? The scripture is very clear. He did tell Mary that. He told Martha that. But you don't mean today. You don't, you don't mean now. You mean somewhere way down the way, something's going to happen. No, I mean today. 
And what I'm telling every cave dweller today, every tomb dweller today, is simply this. Jesus Christ can make a difference in your life today. And I'll tell you how you do that in just a moment. But for the moment, his instructions to Martha, take away the stone, move the stone. And she said, Lord, you don't understand. He'd been in there four days. And it's not going to be a pleasant odor if we remove this stone. The King James Version gives it very directly. She said, by now, he stinks. He, he stinks. This is not going to be, go well. And the Lord did not change his mind. As a matter of fact, had he chosen to do it, he could have moved a stone. He could have spoken one word, and that stone would have blown into smithereen. Or better yet, he could have just called Lazarus, and he came through stone and all. It didn't, nothing, nothing had to change. Nothing had to move. But the scripture says that he didn't do that. And here's the key. The Lord will never do for us what we can do for ourselves. And there are some things in life that he wants to involve us in the process of whatever he is doing at any given time, on any given day. And so he told them to remove the stone. And apparently they did obey his instruction. Then he said something else, not to them, but to Lazarus. Lazarus, come forth. I wonder what happened in that tomb when the Lord spoke those words. I wonder, was Lazarus obviously placed there in a horizontal position? Surely they didn't stack the poor guy up in the corner somewhere of the tomb. And not only that, but when he heard the word of the Lord, he got to decide, is this real? Is it really happening? Did I hear what I thought I heard? Did I hear whom I thought I heard? Yes, Lazarus, you heard exactly right. You heard exactly what he said. You heard what he said. Come forth. Come out of there. And so with that, Lazarus would begin his movement and no doubt about it, when they bandaged Lazarus for burial, they would have bandaged his arms individually and his legs individually. I have to believe that. They didn't wrap him up like a mummy, Egyptian mummy, and he was able to move one leg and then the other and come out. After all, he still wound up in the grave clothes. We know that when he came out of that tomb. And if he had been bound all the way around, both arms and both legs, he would have come, had to come out like somebody in a sack race. You can't do that. He, did, he didn't do that. He came out. He obeyed the Lord. And the scripture says when he did, he told those who were there, unloosen the bandages, unwrap the grave clothes, another suggestion that was not going to be very pleasant. After all, I know he's only been there four days, but by now, these bandages could be blood-soaked. They could have been uh, just saturated with who knows what that was coming out of his body, and that's not going to be a very pleasant experience. What I want you to know today is simply this. The scripture says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty unto God, unto the pulling down of strongholds. What we are facing today and what we have been facing for the last year is a stronghold. About a year, 15 months ago to be exact, this world, this country, was put in a tomb. Maybe we weren't in the death chamber, but we weren't out in the land of the living either. We were kind of in that front section. We really weren't in the land of the living. We were just kind of somewhere between life and death, but as close to one as we were the other. 
And through this time, 15 months of it, we have tried to find our way as the Lord has led, and we believe that He has done that. That was absolutely one tormented soul that the Lord ran into. There was one dead soul that He spoke to in that tomb. But make this clear. When the Lord said, Lazarus, come forth, only Lazarus was going to come forth. If He had not called His name, there would have been a mass resurrection that day. Make no mistake about it. And one day there will be a mass resurrection. But not today. Not today. And what I'm telling anyone who is living in the tomb, and I'm not going to call your name. I don't need to. I could, but I'm not going to. But the Lord is calling your name. And whether you're in the walls of this sanctuary or outside of this church building, maybe even outside of the state, you're listening. And I want to be abundantly clear. For all intents and purposes, you are in a tomb. You are in a place of self-preservation. You have decided, I'm not going to take any risk. I'm not going to put myself in jeopardy. I want you to understand today, that's no place to be. And today, the Lord is calling you by name. I'm not going to. I don't have to. His voice will be abundantly clear. And He's asking you, come out of that tomb. Come out of here. Get on with your life. Get on with worship. So, Pastor I don't understand what tomb are you talking about. I'm talking about the tomb, by the way, in the original Greek language, the root word means to recall or to remember. And many of our tombs are of our own making. Many of our tombs are of our own choice. And they, we are there because we keep remembering, we keep recalling, something somebody has said, the negative stuff that has gone on in the last 15 months is beyond measure. It absolutely has. And make no mistake about it, we ought, the scripture says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And if you get enough of that coming at you, eventually, even if you don't believe it, you start adjusting your life, you start changing your life, you start living your life according to what you're hearing, what everybody else is saying. And so there are those this morning who are in the tomb of fear. You're in there. You've been in there for 15 months. I'm telling you today, get your courage up. In the name of Jesus Christ, come out of that tomb. Come out into the land of the living. Come at who your church family. Come and worship with us. You need to Understand, the scripture says, the Lord did not give us a spirit of fear. If you've got a spirit of fear this morning, God didn't give it to you. The Lord has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. And the sound mind will take care of the fear problem. But you have to believe the Lord. You have to decide which one you're going to believe, the word of God or the word of the world. It's that simple. It's that simple. We're here now. And not only that, but you may be in the tomb of self-contentment. It's kind of interesting, as we said a few weeks ago, about the man by the pool of Bethesda. If you stay there long enough, you kind of get used to it. God forbid that anyone today should get comfortable with the way we have had to live in the last 15 months. That's not God's plan. It may have been for that time. We did what we had to do when we had to do it. But now I'm telling you, we're coming out of the tomb. We are out of the tomb. And we want and are going to have a revival. There's going to be a revival. I don't know what the new church is going to look like. I know this. I don't believe it's going to look like the old church. 
I don't believe that for a minute. God knows, and I'm telling you, it's up to the individual to decide which side of the tomb do you want to be on. Are you going to be hiding out in there as close to the death chamber as you are to the land of the living? Or are you going to come out like the young man did and cry out unto the Lord and let the Lord this morning get rid of that demon because make no mistake about it, that is simply a demon that will not let you go. And only Jesus can command him out of your life. And you have to allow him to do that. Maybe you're in the tomb this morning, the tomb of self-pity. You've been wallowing in self-pity for so long that you don't know what it is. This man could have done that. This man, like the thief on the cross, took the first chance he had to fall down at the feet of Jesus. And by the way, I love this. I just love this. That man was so possessed with demons, God knows how many there were. We know there apparently were at least 2,000 of them because that's how many swine went into the road. But isn't this interesting? That man was so, so filled, so saturated with demons in his body. But when he bowed down and fell before the Lord, on his face before the Lord, every one of those demons had to bow with him. Let me tell you what, that will probably be the only time the demons, until they have beat their eternal doom, when they will ever acknowledge the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And that day, they had no choice. But when the man went down, they went with him. And make no mistake about it, you can be wallowing in self-pity until you don't even remember the life that you had and you don't even remember the life that you could have that's out there. I can tell you today, it's time to come out of that tomb of self-pity. Maybe your self-pity and your contentment has turned into something more. And you better be careful about this because there's a fine line between one and another. Maybe you're in the tomb of rebellion this morning. Maybe you have refused to listen to the Lord and do what he told you to do and do what you know he's right to do so long that now you just don't want to do it. God forbid you'll ever allow that to happen. He says, my spirit will not always strive with man, and it will not. The strange thing is, you don't know when that line is. You don't know where it is. When your want to turns into your don't want to, and no longer do you have that desire to come out of your tomb. Maybe this morning you just have a fear of coming out. Maybe it's just a matter of complacency. You've just become so content with where you are that now you just don't even want to do anything different. You're just content. That's no way to live, and that's no place to live. Not when the Lord is calling you. He's calling this morning the church to revival. And let me tell you, what we need this morning is not just a revival. What we need is a resurrection. We need the Lord to listen, to, say the, to utter those same words. I don't know how loud the Lord had to speak when he spoke to Lazarus that day. I know that it was loud enough for Lazarus to hear it. And I'm telling you this morning, the Lord does not necessarily shout. In fact, he doesn't shout. Because what you'll hear is that still, small voice. He's not in the wind. He's not in the earthquake. He's in that still, small voice. But his voice is unmistakable. My sheep hear my voice, and they know me. And another they will not follow. And so this morning, the Lord is speaking. And I'm asking you to come out of the tomb. I'm asking you this morning to come out of your cave. You've been in, sh in what you believe to be a safe place. And maybe it is, from a physical standpoint, a safe place. But it's not necessarily a spiritual place. The Lord has a way of changing things. He's always changing things. And the, he's opening the door. And he's telling everybody this morning, come on out, come on out. I want to tell you, 
I want to congratulate you this morning for accepting the invitation to obviously come out of your tomb. There are others who have not, and I would single out some this morning that I am so glad to see, but I'm not going to risk showing partiality. I'm not going to do that. To me, each and every one who is here this morning represents somebody who at some point heard the verse, voice of the Lord. As we have listened in these last 15 months as a church, we have obeyed and done what we knew to do at the time. We will be talking about what we will do going forward, but right now we are where we are. And we believe that we are where the Lord wants us to be. But I'm here today to tell you, I'm not going back in the tomb. I'm not going back to hiding out and hiding from anything, not once the Lord has given me the invitation, the opportunity to come this far. The only thing I plan to do is move forward. I'm not moving back. And I pray and I trust that you will decide you want to go with me. You want to go with me. Because this is the time for the Lord to speak. And he is speaking. Make no mistake about it. He has spoken to us through every song that we have heard this morning. For the one that you have shared. Our God reigns. You have heard him speak to you through victory in Jesus. You've heard him speak to you through the goodness of God. And make no mistake about it, he'll speak to you individually and personally this morning. I'm praying that for this moment, you'll just have your ears tuned to the Spirit of our Lord. And you'll hear him calling you out of whatever tomb you may have, have been or may even now be. And I'm not just talking to the people within the walls of this church. You please understand that. I'm talking to people beyond this community, beyond this church. I'm talking to people who just need to hear the voice of the Lord. And by the way, I say it before and I say it again. When he's calling you, he'll call your name. And you won't have to look over your shoulder wondering who he's talking about behind me. You know who who he's talking to, absolutely. And so the invitation is yours and the responsibility. You see, our worship service has two main parts, certainly for the sermon. There is the reception of God's word. It's my responsibility to come here on any given Sunday morning and be prepared to preach. I don't know and I don't begin a sermon with apology, and I don't end with one. But I'll tell you this, I don't know if I've ever had a sermon that I didn't think, you know, I'd like to do that over, I'd like to preach that over. I don't know if I've ever had a funeral service that I think, I didn't do that person justice. I didn't do what I would like to have done. All I know is I did the best I could with what God gave me. I, it's my responsibility to make sure that you hear so that you might receive the Word of God, what James called the engrafted Word of God, which is able to save your soul. But once that Word leaves here and gets to you, then you've got a responsibility to respond. You can receive the Word of God, and I pray you've done that. Now, in just a few moments, you're going to have the opportunity to respond to the Word of God. And in these few moments, could be moments that change your life. But for now, as our worship team comes, I'm going to share an invitation with you, and I want everyone to listen, and I mean listen closely, with what I'm about to say. Because there is a good possibility that you might take exception to what I'm about to tell you. Over in the last 10 years or more, You've heard about life after life, death after life experiences, people who said that they came so close to death that they saw a great light, they felt 
a warm feeling in their body. They were aware of what was going on on earth. In fact, there have been books written about it. And there have been a lot of things. I haven't heard much recently, but there was a time when this was the subject of the hour about life after life and death after death. And I want to tell you, in every county, the rescue people have medicine and equipment that they may very well bring you back, resuscitate you, revive you, whatever you want to call it. But make no mistake about it, if that is possible, whatever you were, you were not dead. Please be clear. What we're told is, a person may be clinically dead, but when you die, there's nothing and no one who's going to bring you back. That's just the reality of it. That's just the way it is. When the Lord calls you home, you're going home. You're not going to go part way down the road and make a U-turn and come back. And I don't know, and I don't question the Apostle Paul. He said, I was caught up to the third heaven. He said, I wasn't allowed to repeat what I heard, and I couldn't find words to describe what I saw. John, on the other hand, in the book of Revelation, was told to write what he saw and what he heard. And so the apostle Paul obviously had a near-death experience. But let's be abundantly clear. It was not a death experience. Near death, maybe. Death, no. Because he came back from that and he ministered for years to come and one day he knew his time was coming and his time came and God took him home. God took him home. What I want you to to tell you today is don't hibernate in your tomb before time. There will be a time when the Lord will call you home. Don't push it. Don't advance it. You're in the land of the living. Act like it. Live like it. Worship like it. Testify to the Lord. Testify to the world. I'm going on with my life. I'm going to live the way the Lord wants me to live. And I refuse to live like somebody who is as close to the death chamber as I am for the land of the living. I refuse to live in that vestibule of no man's land, and that really is what it is. I'm in the land of the living. And so the scripture says, as we live, we take up our cross and we follow him. We serve the Lord. Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, 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 no. There's a cross for everyone and there's a cross for me. And I'm taking mine up. And I'm not spending my time in the tomb. Let's have a tomb revival this morning. Let's have a tomb resurrection. Because Jesus Christ is calling everyone. And he's calling by name. Come on out. Come on out. Welcome to the land of the living. And it's our job to make sure that they're able to do precisely that. As we stand, as we sing. Would you listen to the Lord?
smile this morning with grateful heart to know that you refuse to leave us in our tombs, many of which are man-made, self-made. You call us and you call us by name and you call us out to the land of the living. Lord, we know that Lazarus, according to the scripture, never spoke a word, but boy, did he give us a lesson. Did he teach us something about obeying, listening to the voice of our Lord. When he calls, when he tells us to come forth, and what that must have been when Lazarus stepped out that day and saw his family, saw his friends, but most of all, he saw his Savior. And one day we're going to see him also. We'll see our loved ones. We'll be reunited. We'll have a grand and glorious reunion. The former things will be passed away. But for now, we've got work to do. And it all begins when the Lord says, calling us by name, come out of that tomb. Come out of that tomb and do it now. We thank you for his invitation. We gladly accept it in Jesus' name. Amen. is proper English or not, but nonetheless, all of God's people said, I'm done with my tomb. <laughs> 